Hi there. This is a video sort of for beginners or newbies to Gnosticism, uh, really describing the origins of Gnosticism <clears throat> from a social political sort of viewpoint, somewhat reductionist, I have to say, but there you are. Um, I mean, the first thing to say about Gnosticism is that you know you have to look at it in context. And uh, I suppose the most obvious context, uh, looking at Gnosticism from the point of view of, of its origins in the second century uh, BCE, perhaps, and the origins second century CE, uh, is that um, life was brutal and short, uh, and high infant mortality rates, which is, you know, which is sort of like a <laughs> an understatement because you know people say oh, well they didn't mind losing half their children before the age of five uh, well actually they did uh, you know mothers did mind losing their children as mothers do all the time uh, now and and always have to have done uh, you know it's a terrible thing to lose your child and really it's not until you get to the 1960s uh, that infant mortality rates in the west um, go down significantly um, so all, you know, through the 96,000 years of human evolution, uh, children have died very regularly before the age of five. And, um, and sometimes they died, you know, uh, when they were good and strong as well. Uh, you know, when you thought they were 18 and thought they had their lives ahead of them, they died of some ridiculous little virus or something, um, or plague or whatever. Uh, so life was pretty awful uh, in the second century. Um, and people really, really did hope uh, that there was a better life to be had elsewhere uh, in another dimension after death, uh, that, that you would go to some transcendental uh, realm uh, or a land of milk and honey uh, where there weren't any viruses and civil wars and wars and, and injustices and, and horrors generally, um, and that uh, life would be better. Uh, and you wish that for your loved ones, obviously, who, you know, who passed on. Um, and so, obviously, you know, it's, it's like the idea of a transcendental God and a, a transcendental realm away from this veil of tears and valley of death, um, obviously, is so powerful. You know, I mean, it, it makes complete sense. Um, I mean, nowadays, you know, maybe it doesn't make complete sense because we... Uh, we have a secular solution uh, to suffering, uh, a humanist solution to suffering, which I will talk about a bit later. Um, and, but so that's one thing. And then the second thing, of course, is Gnosticism arises uh, and arises now today uh, because suffering is still a, abounds today in injustice and war and fat and horror. The four horsemen still ride out today as they ever have uh, and for four corners of the globe. Uh, wreaking havoc and death and suffering uh, and, and appalling injuries and I don't know just the st and then the stuff that goes on even in the West you know uh, with people looking after their Alzheimer parents and, uh, and and you know all this kind of stuff I mean it's horrific what's going on at the moment uh, with the geriatric crisis uh, in the West and, and the fracturing of, of family life and there aren't the families there and, and because the nuclear families, I mean, it, it's all very complex. So, um, but anyway, uh, today there is suffering, obviously. Um, and people kind of thought to themselves, how can, a, how can a good God allow all this to happen? Especially allow it to happen to good people uh, as well. Um, you know, people that done nothing wrong in their lives and then, and then they have the most terrible suffering visited on them and calamity and everything. Um, and it, mu it must mean that, you know, I, either, either this God is evil, um, that actually is evil, uh, or that's the worst case scenario. The best case scenario is, uh, is that God is both good and evil, um, and perhaps preserving creative and destructive, that's all you can say. Um, and then, you know, you can say that perhaps this good God uh, you know, it, it is in fact not omniscient and um, you know that there, there's a sort of impersonal power basically of, of existence which which the good God can't overcome uh, or very rarely overcomes I mean sometimes miracles do happen uh, but they're very few and far between and um, what usually happens 
um, is that uh, you know you've got like um, uh, you know this this god is almost <laughs> almost a prisoner of this impersonal mechanical universe that doesn't care about the swallow falling and all this you know um, so that's the three scenarios. And that's the sort of question mark that people uh, think about, um, ordinary people, I think, as well. How can a good God allow all this suffering to happen, especially to good people? And it doesn't seem fair, it doesn't seem just, and it doesn't seem right. Um, and uh, so either, you know, we're not perceiving things correctly, uh, but I think we are, uh, or, that, or that there is, um, you know, that God is both good and evil, or not omniscient, uh, or, or totally evil. Um, and if God is good and evil as well, uh, then that's a sort of, that's kind of based on the idea of the Oriental potentate who gives with one hand and takes with the other, uh, and is, a, it, you know, doesn't take into account, uh, is non-egalitarian, let us say, uh, and just takes uh, and gives um, according to their whim, which is the sort of idea of the, of the tyrant or the, or the Oriental potentate, which is uh, a lot of what people see God as being. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that uh, so they have no problem with God being, they say that is good. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that God works in mysterious ways and that is the good and that's your lot, that's your lot and that's, that's, you know, uh, death is the wages of sin anyway, uh, it's because, and, and explanations for why uh, good things, bad things happen to good people. Um, and, and good things happen to bad people for that matter. Well, that's explained uh, through the original sin and all that kind of stuff. Um, but people have questioned that as well and questioned the character of a God who would, who would set it all up to be like that. Um, and why would you set it up so that, you know, uh, that, you know, you fall out of reconciliation, then you fall back into, rec then you go back into reconciliation. You know, what, what's the point of it? What's the meaning of it? Like there doesn't seem to be any ultimate meaning. Um, and then, of course, the answer is uh, that there is no God um, and that we've all got to look after ourselves and each other. Uh, and uh, there's a humanist answer to all this. And, and uh, you know, there's only the brain. Uh, and it's up to us to, to forge our own destinies um, as it is, in fact, our communities uh, to, to uh, help us to forge our own destinies and to give us the tools to make the tools to help ourselves. Uh, which is, you know, which is sort of the modern way of looking at things. Uh, and other people say that the state should look after its cradle to grave and all this, uh, although not many people think that nowadays anyway. Um, so, you know, uh, I, and people have questioned whether there actually is any God or, or any meaning to the universe for a very, very long time. Uh, that goes back to the ancient Greeks, um, you know, with, with the atheists and the atheist sects of, of ancient Greece and indeed ancient India. Uh, people, there were atheists and humanists and secularists uh, abounding, um, and naturalists abounding uh, in, in ancient India as well. Um, and uh, so, but then also people have this idea that they have had extraordinary experiences, uh, visions and dreams and transcendental experiences. Uh, that seem to point uh, to indeed a transcendental uh, realm. Um, of total goodness, of total bliss, of total happiness, of total uh, of non-scarcity of resources, uh, abundance, infinite abundance indeed. Um, and people have, have, have said that these visions were so real, seemed so real that, 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 they, were, that they were there, that they could actually touch, uh, sort of touch uh, this ineffable realm and experience it on some fundamental level, as fundamental as indeed, you know, you touch your keyboard or you touch your computer mouse or whatever, uh, or you touch your own face or somebody else's face for that matter. Um, and uh, it's a fundamental experience on that order uh, sort of thing. Uh, and that, of course, has given people hope uh, that indeed after we die, we do get, go to a better place, which of course brings us back to the original idea of transcendence, which is transcendence out of this horrific world. Um, so, and I think these thoughts are still abounding around in people, uh, as much as even more perhaps than humanist, secularist and atheist thoughts, um, and an acceptance that there isn't any meaning to life. Uh, life is what you make it. Uh, and I think a lot of people accept that, 
but at the same time they also um, believe that uh, there is a, a happier life after death uh, which some people have experienced on a fundamental level uh, in this life uh, and not just on the borders of death I have not near dead near death experiences although they would probably count uh, people have been quite sane and healthy and everything and have had spontaneous uh, experiences which point uh, to a transcendental world or transcendental state um, and this transcendental state uh, is is beyond uh, this world um, and perhaps this transcendental state or transcendental being is occupied uh, by a personal deity who is all good um, uh, and who is not evil or good and evil uh, and is not a, a, an oriental potentate uh, but is in fact a god who loves uh, his children um, and who, who gives his children everything uh, basically uh, and you may say, well, that sort of sounds like spoiling the child, if you don't mind me saying so. Um, but that's kind of reducing it down to the human level. Uh, whereas we're talking about a transcendental state, um, which is where people are mature about receiving things uh, for free uh, and appreciate uh, the infinite abundance of the ineffable world uh, in a way that people don't appreciate or perhaps don't appreciate handouts now you know, uh, because we are hardwired to struggle uh, and perhaps we, we don't like it when people take away that, that struggle within us uh, by giving us everything that we want, so, you know, um, but, but in this ineffable realm, I'm talking about transcendental realm, uh, that psychology doesn't pertain, you see. Um, it's difficult for us to imagine that at all, in fact. In fact, it's difficult for us to imagine or conceptualise any such ineffable world of non-dualism, so-called non-dualism, because this world, uh, you know, is dualistic. So you have, uh, you know, pain and pain and pleasure, you have black and white, you have all these binaries together, um, uh, and you have things that you go towards and things that you, go, you come away from, uh, although some people seem to go towards the things that they should uh, avoid. Uh, and avoid the things that they should not avoid, um, which gives rise to calumny, uh, confusion, chaos, um, and uh, calamity, uh, and, uh, and and all the rest, and conceit, and everything like that, and um, and the birth of people, uh, selfishness, and all that kind of stuff, which which is you know the characteristic, obviously, of a of an individual who is desperately trying to survive. Um, uh, you know, um, and people, you know, one thinks of the crime levels in the USA born out of desperation, uh, as well as a fractured society that is uh, that is heading towards uh, disaster on a huge scale. But we won't, won't go into that. Um, uh, so, you know, life is in our hands to an extent, but there's an infinite factor, uh, infinite unknown. Um, there is, a, you know, Lady Luck comes into it as well, but in this uh, transcendental state or transcendental realm it's not a matter of luck, it's not a matter of making your own destiny uh, because, uh, you know, all this, is the, the infinite, there is no scarcity. Uh, you see, when there is scarcity, scarcity more or less maps out the things that we must do and the things that we, you know, are necessary in order to survive. Um, and, and that uh, is rejected by the Gnostic. Uh, but the main thing about Gnosticism is this thing about experiential uh, evidence. You know, you experience something which is so extraordinary, uh, so other than your normal everyday experience, uh, so miraculous, uh, even sometimes in its effects, um, that, uh, that it, it points the way uh, to something uh, to point the way to a reality uh, which we're able to experience, which is other than this reality. Um, and furthermore, it seems, uh, well, to the Gnostics, or to many Gnostics anyway, classical in the past, that, that this world is truly evil uh, and is ruled over by an evil god. Um, and maybe, maybe the, well, certainly a, a tyrannical god. Uh, maybe not an evil god, but a tyrannical god, a god that does take away with one hand and gives with the other, 
um, in a, in an arbitrary and extraordinary an arbitrary way, uh, in a in a cruel and unusual way, uh, simply to simply out of some sort of sadistic uh, agenda which it, which it's uh, following, uh, and, and we are bewildered uh, by the by the decisions that this tyrant makes, uh, as indeed you know all tyrants make decisions which are bewildering uh, to their subordinates. Um, and sometimes, you know, uh, the tyrant is working on intuition, uh, but sometimes the tyrant has, has lost his or her mind uh, and is just, uh, I don't know, uh, doing things uh, out of complete abandon and debauchery uh, and for no concern for anything or anybody um, or even for their own success. Uh, they're on the road to nowhere, on the road to self-destruction. Um, and this is the figure of God uh, that a lot of Gnostics actually have. It's a very grim uh, view of existence and a grim view of, of, of deity uh, and the forces that actually govern us. Uh, they are uh, controlled. This here's a zoo and the keeper ain't you, as Lou Reed would say um, and sang. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a, a, a zoo. In fact, it's a, it's a trap for us, for our consciousnesses. Uh, we are trapped in this hellish world um, and we are trapped in a world which distracts us uh, from, from the transcendental. This is the main thing. So even when we're not suffering, uh, even when we're successful, even when we're picking up a global, you know, a, a golden globe or an, or an Oscar, uh, we, we, you know, it's, it's just, that's just a distraction anyway. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a temporary pleasure. Uh, uh, augmented, uh, uh, mixed in uh, with all the suffering, uh, which again, the suffering is also impermanent, I suppose, as well. We go from pleasure to pain and back again. Um, but, but in the transcendental world that Gnostics envisage, or some Gnostics claim they have experienced, uh, you don't have pleasure and pain. You don't, you don't have this duality. Uh, you just have pure consciousness, uh, pure being, uh, as it were, and pure bliss, uh, what the Hindus called sit satananda, um, which is which is a, a, an inconceivable state uh, of being, uh, which is un which is unconditioned and unconditional. Um, so uh, you know this is about this is how I understand Gnosticism anyway, um, and I and I and I think that to be a Gnostic. Uh, is to not expect very much from this world. That's, that's the main thing. Uh, you live in this world uh, and you live with kindness and compassion. I mean, you, you, you generate kindness and compassion by your actions and attitudes, um, but you don't expect much of other people or you don't expect much of, of the world. Um, and uh, if things don't go right, well, that, that it is how it is. Um, and you have to let go of of crying against the night. You don't, we, Gnostics don't rage against the night uh, like the poet does. Um, you know, it, it's just uh, it's just the way it is, really. Um, and although you might try and help other people and help other communities, uh, you know very well that even your best efforts might come to nothing, uh, or, or might certainly um, you know hit quicksand eventually. Uh, and that tyrants uh, and empires and cruelty and injustice uh, are the norm, basically. Uh, and, and justice uh, and, and uh, democracy are, are miracles that happen occasionally um, and not regularly. Um, because, and, and that's the way it is. So um, I suppose Gnostics have a pragmatic view of life, not exactly cynical, um, because that would be too nihilistic, but certainly uh, a non-expectation and a, a non-grasping uh, onto reality and onto the things that was, are supposed to matter, like fame and money and all that kind of stuff. Um, but at the same time, you know, you can be creative in this world um, and you can be preserving. Um, and I suppose if necessary, you know, people, you know, you, well, you could go to war in order to defend the things that you believe are worth defending. Uh, but I mean, obviously, you you try every non, uh, every diplomatic channel uh, as you, you know, as much as you could. But um, if you have to go to war, well, you have to go to war. Uh, and then, you know, uh, as my partner says, that she would fight a war with all 
you know, with with all ruthlessness and expediency. <laughs> you know, she says she's a pacifist, uh, but if she had to fight a war, uh, she would jolly well fight it. Um, so, you know, we're not saying that uh, we can be pure either, or pure in this world. We're not can be pure vegan or pure pacifist or uh, or purely lovable, loving, or purely unconditional in our acceptance for the people. You're not going to be that, all right? <laughs> because this world is tracked out, mapped out, if you right, if you will, uh, for us to do simply what we think is necessary to do. Um, and although we have a higher mind that, that sometimes miraculously picks a, a non-violent or non-aggressive or non-negative way of dealing with things, uh, you know, don't be surprised about your own negativity, quite frankly. Uh, don't, don't expect too much of yourself either, really. You know, uh, you, you are not perfect and you're not going to behave in a perfect way. That's, that's just a given. Um, and you have to keep telling yourself that every day, really. Uh, because I think that, uh, you know, this desire to be perfect, of course, and desire to be pure, um, has led to incredible brutality and incredible, uh, you know, six million Jews being murdered. Uh, that was out of a desire for purity, desire, for, desire to, um, to be perfect, a desire to create a utopia, uh, and look how that ended. Um, so be skeptical about utopians uh, and well-intentioned people. Um, so, okay, so that's my little introduction to Gnosis, uh, as far as I understand it anyway. Uh, and if you wish to add anything or take anything away from my description, uh, then please do so in the comments below.